Hello world. So I bought some handcrafted, traditionally made Japanese knives and I kind of messed a couple of them up. So I want to tell you about that story. And um, I wanted to tell you because I think the world of knives is a bit intimidating and there's a lot to learn. And I'm a total newbie to all of this. So I thought bringing you along that journey of learning that I've had might help someone else who's new to knives and especially Japanese knives. I think I will make mistakes, so I apologize for them. I try to learn as much as possible. So if I may make mistakes, I'm very sorry about that. And this will be kind of more of a raw, unedited video or less edited video. So this is the condition of the knife literally two weeks after I gave it to my sister-in-law. How did it get to that point so quickly? To get to that, I'm going to have to rewind a bit. My wife and I were set to go to Etizen, where among a few traditional crafts they do, they handcraft knives. As my sister-in-law was going to watch our kids while we were away, we thought one of those knives would be a great gift, especially since she cooks a lot. She was in fact very nervous about owning an expensive knife and told us not to buy her one. Um, but when we went to the knife factory, Ryusen Hamono, and met with the CEO, the knife master, we asked him the question of, can an everyday cook buy and use one of these things? And this is what he had to say. あの、ま、切り分けるドームなので、そこはもう思う存分使ってほしいと思いますし、え、どうでしょう、あの、うちのお客様では、え、20年、30年はもう当たり前ですし、ま、場合によっては次の世代、え、ま、そこのお母さん
but the words of the CEO of Yusen Hamono kind of sprang into my mind. あの、ま、メンテナンスの方もあの、メーカーに返さなくても通常できるメンテナンスっていうのはえ、ちょっと指導してさせていただければ、あの、決して傷つくことがあ、ないように、あの、歯は回復できるので、ま、そういったところはあ
piece of metal because you can stress it a lot and it won't break, but it will bend, right? Whereas if I take this knife in, <laughs> no, I'm not going to even try that. This, I mean, if you did that, I think it'll break eventually or at least chip pieces off. So it's hard, but it's not tough, right? You can, if you stress it enough, it will break. And so that's a difference. So this type of knife, I can abuse it a lot more because it's a softer steel and it won't break. Yeah. I hope you can read that. So this is a 180 millimeter Sanelli knife. It's made in Italy, but it's called a Japanese knife. I guess it's Japanese style. And the makeup of the steel is X50 CRMO14. Kind of sounds cryptic, but the X 50, it stands for, X stands for carbon <laughs> in this case, and it's 0.5% carbon, whereas the CR stands for chromium, and it's 14% chromium. So carbon makes something hard, chromium makes something soft. Um, but the reason you have so much chromium in there is because you want the stainless capabilities. So yeah, I could leave this in water overnight and just throw it into the dish pit here and it'll be fine. So it can take a lot of abuse, but um, the hardness takes a hit. So on the Rockwell hardness scale, it's a 54 to 56. Now there's actually a lot more elements you can add to a knife besides chromium and carbon uh, to make it do different things. So Vandium is one of them. So with a Wusthof knife, what is it? It's an X50 CRMOV15 is what you'll see written on a Wusthof knife. I'm probably mispronouncing that, sorry Germans. Um, but it'll get it harder, so it's a 58 on the Rockwell hardness scale. That's cool. And this is a HAP40 knife. And it has a lot more of those hard components in it. Um, so carbon is at like 1.3% or 1.4%, something around that. It's not that much more, but it makes a difference. It's also a powdered steel. It's like a high speed stool stool high speed tool steel and um, you can get it way harder it's like a 64 to 66 according to the manufacturer but depending on how you treat it it can get even harder than that um, so the point of a powdered high speed tool steel i believe i'm saying it right is that um, you can get it harder yet retain some of the toughness but still even as you know, tough as that steel is, it's not going to be as tough as this. There are so many different steels I could talk about, but the last one I will is this Japanese steel, which is called VG10. And it's supposed to be hard as well as stainless. And um, so it's very popular with Japanese people. And it is a 60 on the Rockwell hardness scale. Now, another thing about this knife is that it has what's called Damascus cladding. It's not a like Damascus knife all the way through or something like that. I believe that technology has been lost to the ages. But Damascus cladding, you can see this pattern here, it means that you have soft and hard stainless steel that are like so many layers. I believe this one's 33 layers, if I'm correct. And that makes that pattern when you um, make the knife. So it's kind of cool looking. As far as I can tell, Western knives are a lot more standardized and mass produced. Now it could just be that I don't know much about knives, but Japanese knives seem to have a lot more variety to them. The types of steel that are used and the different types of knives. So this is called a Santoku, this is called a Nagiri, and there's Gyuto, and there's just a ton of different styles of Japanese knives, as well as handles. You can see this one's octagog uh, octagonal. <laughs> I'll try that again. This one is octagonal, and this one's kind of octagonal, but not quite. It's a really nice handle though, beautiful. And as I said before, the thing about Japanese knives is because they are harder, they can require different sharpening techniques, and one of the most recommended ones is whetstones. Now, because I got hard Japanese knives, this meant that I had to look into cutting boards, because while people want their knives hard, um, you actually want the opposite with your cutting board. You don't want a hard cutting board, otherwise it'll dull your hard knife. So plastic cutting boards, like all these ones that I had were not great. Um, or 
I mean, you can use them, of course, but they will, they will dull your knife faster. I should mention though that there are soft plastics and there are hybrids that you can get, but um, I'm going to just talk about wood. And so this is a wood I got from Kochi and it is a Hinoki R. Cypress. And so there are so many different types of woods. There's maple, there's teak, there is cypress, Hinoki, and this is called Kiri. Yeah. And so yeah, this cutting board is from Kochi, which I actually visited last year. And it's made from a single piece of wood. So I believe it'll be less hard to break than a laminated end grain or edge grain board. Although this is a soft wood, so it might not last as long for other reasons. Um, but so the thing about Hinoki, which is cypress, is that it's a aromatic wood. So in Japanese saunas, you'll often have this and it's a nice smelling wood. Oh, there's my cats being fed. And versus a hardwood like maple, this board is actually quite light. But even lighter is this wood. It's a Hinoki and it's not Hinoki, it's sorry, it's Kiri. And this wood over here, it is super light. Um, and I think it has bigger pores, so I don't believe it'll last as long. But it was, it was quite popular in the stores when I went around the knife shops in Kapabashi, a famous area for buying kitchen equipment in Tokyo. It was really cheap too, relatively. So it was about $15 US. So the thing I learned about wood cutting boards is that they can actually be more sanitary than plastic cutting boards. And um, for example, with maple, the grains there, they're really fine in a hard wood. And so what it'll do, it'll kind of like suck down the bacteria and like trap it in there and kill it. Now, with this type of wood, it is a soft wood. And so the grains are bigger. And so it's kind of a different action that happens. So when I did the research about this one, it's a kind of a special type of cypress. Um, I think there's stuff grown in Aomori and apparently this one in Kochi as well. They have antibacterial properties. So they're supposed to be good as well. Um, now the thing with plastic cutting boards is initially they're really easy to sanitize. And so people think, okay, that's really good. But then if you look at this board, I've had it for a while and it's okay. I'm going to bring it closer because it's super shiny. So yeah, look at that. I don't think that's sanitary anymore. And the thing is because you get these deep grooves and the stuff just gets stuck in there and doesn't come out. So it's a bit different than a wood cutting board. So I should really just throw this away. And this cutting board is very hard. So I don't think it's really great for your knives. Since 90% of what we'll cut is going to be fruits and vegetables, we're going to mainly use our wood cutting boards and for the meats and fish, just because my wife likes to be really, really heavy on the bleach, we're going to use the plastic cutting boards for that. That's like 10% of the time. And the thing is you can't use bleach on wood. It will break down the wood and destroy it and it's not good. So just another tip for you. Don't use bleach on your wood and wash them off and dry them right away after using. So once I had the cutting board thing solved, the other worry I had was getting and keeping the knives sharp. And so what actually happened is a long journey of sharpening. And this started over a year ago. And the first stone I got was this one. It's a king, I think it's a 1,000, 6,000 grit. So 1,000 is the rougher, harder side. And 6,000 is the smoother side. And so what everybody recommended was to get a cheaper stone and to practice with cheaper knives. So this knife is from Ikea, it's a $10 knife. This knife is um, actually from a chef kitchen store, but it's a like a $40 knife. So good knife to practice on. And so when I was sharpening, I was doing them, you know, manually. I was looking at like hours and hours and hours of videos about sharpening. And the key about sharpening is that you want to have a consistent angle. And a lot of knives nowadays have a 15 degree angle, but whether you put it at like 20 or 10 or 15 or 17 or 16, I think most people say, um, from what I read is that it's most important to get a consistent angle. So you have to like keep it at whatever angle you choose. Um, so I got this and for a year I practiced and I got the knives sharp, but I didn't think they were that, I didn't know they were, I wasn't doing that great of a job. 
um, because after I got this thing, this is like an angle guide that you clip on to your knife. And so what this ha helps you do is keep it at a consistent angle the whole way through, right? It's a really, it's like $6, this thing. And um, the thing about this, it changed the game completely. Once I used this, I was like, oh wow, this is how sharp I can get knives if I have a consistent angle. So this really helped me. Although some people think it's kind of like a crutch, like training wheels, and so you're never going to learn how to do it properly. But honestly, <laughs> it's helped me so much. So if you have trouble like doing it on your own or find, finding out the right angle, and I tried different tricks like putting pennies under or something like this height, and I just couldn't do it right. Um, this thing can really help when you're learning. And because I got better knives, I decided to invest in better stones. So I have three Shopton ceramic wet stones. So this one's like a 320 grit, like this. And then this one's 1,500, so medium. And this one is 5,000. And I really like the feel of these stones a lot better. But once you add up the price of these stones, and then this to hold the stones, which is really helpful because I found this thing kept on moving around. So this one keeps it really steady. And then I have a leather stropping block with the um, compound. Um, and I think I kind of not doing a good job with this stropping block either. Anyways, that's all like 175 US dollars. Um, so it's more expensive than my new favorite knife. Um, but I think these are something like, especially since I don't use them very often, that you can keep for decades and keep whether it's your cheap knives or your more expensive knives sharp. So I think it's definitely worth the investment. And I've actually found myself enjoying sharpening knives. And so I'm actually trying to sharpen the knives of friends, not their good knives, but just their, their cheaper ones. I'm not comfortable trying to practice on people's nice knives yet. So you might've heard that a bad sharp knife is better than a good dull knife. And I'd agree, but what's even better is a good sharp knife. So um, what you can do is you can take paper like this. This is kind of thin magazine paper. And I've sharpened all these knives good enough that they can cut the paper, right? Yay, everyone likes this. At least in videos, they're always cutting paper. And uh, I, hope I hope I don't embarrass myself uh, and doesn't cut, but yeah, that cuts well. Okay. See, told you I was gonna, going to embarrass, embarrass myself if you don't hit the right angle or something. Sometimes it looks like the knife's not sharp, but yeah, it's sharp. And then lastly, this knife here. Right, they can all cut paper. They're all sharp in that way. But I find the real difference is when you start cutting things. And this is what I've wanted to do ever since I started filming. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to start off with a tomato. That's a favorite thing to cut. I haven't practiced this before, so I don't know how well these will cut this tomato. But let's try and see. So that's actually really good. It was super smooth to cut with this knife. This is a $10 IKEA knife. Okay, $40, $40 knife. Hmm. Yeah. Also really good. I think it got caught on the bottom a little bit. I didn't press down hard enough. Okay, and then this is the kind of laser knife. And yep, really easy. And then this is actually a $300 knife, but we got it on discount because it has these scratches right here and you probably, probably can't even tell. Um, we got it for like half price because of that, so that was cool. Yep. Cuts nice as well. So everything cuts tomatoes good. So honestly, if I was just cutting a tomato, I'd say, wow, these are all pretty good knives. Okay, so now I magically have an apple. And okay, that's... I have to put more pressure down on the apple, which is not a big deal, but the, you know, the cuts are okay. Now, if I take the laser knife, it's just so smooth. I don't know. Oh, wait, <laughs> the apple got in my way. It's just so smooth. Let's try this knife out here. 
This is easier than the Ikea knife. Yeah. That's nice. So one of the vegetables where I noticed the biggest difference was the carrot. And so when I cut with this knife, I feel like once you get to the middle, it's like just not, I don't know, it's smooth. It's not bad, but like when I look at it, I can just see kind of a rough texture. Now with this knife, it glides through so smoothly. I don't have to put much pressure on it. And then it's just so smooth. So the last thing I'll show is a cucumber. And so if I'm not putting much pressure, it's not cutting, which I mean, I can just put pressure on and cut it and I can do the, it'll cut fine. So there's not a big deal, but it's just such a difference because when I take a knife like this now and I just like, I'm, <laughs> I'm not putting pressure on it and it's just cutting right through. It's incredible. And that kind of brings the fun into cutting stuff. Like I really enjoy cutting things now because it's just so easy and smooth. And so if I only did the test with the tomato, I wouldn't have known the difference. But once you start cutting a variety of things, you're like, okay, wow. Like there is a big difference between the knives. One thing I never had anybody tell me is like, how do you avoid these things from rolling off everywhere? I've, I've never figured that out. See, there you go. Okay, from everything I've learned so far, I think these are the two things I can say about Japanese knives versus Western knives. So with the Japanese knives, they are harder and so they can retain their edge longer and they can be sharper for longer, nice sharp knives, okay? The second thing, is that they are thinner. So the grind or the geometry, it's a lot thinner of a knife in comparison to a Western knife on average. So you can also cut easier through things. So I think that's the experience I had with different um, vegetables that I was cutting was that the thinness really helped it cut through. And that's why I think even though this was sharp enough to cut paper and cut tomatoes, it kind of struggled with things like carrots and with the apples. Um, this just, the geometry of this is so much thinner and it performed better and it's hard as well. So something that seemed a little bit crazy to me was that I could actually taste the sharpness. Okay, so. I have all these slices and let me just show you. So I can taste the sharpness. I don't know what meat eating it actually shows you, but it's, it's like slippery and it's, um, I don't know, it just feels good to, to eat. And apparently, because you have such a sharp cut that it'll break a lot less of the cells in something like a carrot or an onion, and so it'll retain the moisture a lot better. So apparently, if you cut an onion with a sharp knife, it's not going to make you cry. So I want to test this. I've never tried this before. Let me try. So far, I'm so good. So that's one batch of onions. Oh, that's what I should have done. Flipped it. Okay. So, you know what? I can feel the onions in my eyes. And um, I don't know about that. Maybe because I chopped so much of it that it's uh, I can I can I can feel it. So I don't know about that. That's what I learned. But maybe it's not as severe as if I had a duller knife cutting it. I don't know. So here's my final thing about knives. I love this Hap 40 knife. It's super thin, kind of like a laser, and it's just so fun to cut with. Um, this VG10, this Nagiri knife, I really like it well. It's such a beautiful knife, and I hope to get a lot of long years out of it. Just not as fun as this one. And I'm still keeping these knives. And so these two over here, but like for this one, if I'm going to cut bones or cut like really hard things like squash, um, I don't want to risk these, these knives. 
So I can just use one of these knives and be safe. And then I have my stones where I can fix it if anything goes wrong, but they are tougher knives, so they can take a lot more abuse. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Right now, this is my current skill level of drunk. This is my cat. Since kindergarten, I've never gotten better. And I think this is even insulting to kindergartners because I know they can draw better than this. So when I saw a class that said I can learn how to draw better, I thought, hey, I'm down for that. So Skillshare, it's a online learning community with thousands of classes and they cover all sorts of creative and entrepreneurial skills. Premium membership will give you unlimited access to all those classes so you can take whatever fancies your interest. You can do it to fuel your curiosity, to be creative or to thrive in your career. It's really whatever you want because Skillshare is a place that helps you learn and grow. And in comparison to in-person classes, it's very affordable. So an annual subscription will cost you less than $10 a month. So it's hard to go wrong, especially since with the link in the description, you can get two months free trial. So what, what is there to lose? At least I'm a better photographer than I am a drawer, but stay tuned for next month when I reveal what my new drawing skills look like. So I really do hope you learned just a little bit from this video. Again, I'm a total noob, so don't ask me questions. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. Uh, what's your favorite knife?